Krishna has a particular service that he created each and every one of us to do for him. And he's just waiting until we get it together to offer him that service. So uh, we have to discover what that service is, what that relationship is. And a big clue to the nature of that service, the nature of that relationship, is what we love. Huh? For example, I really love music. I've loved music my whole life. I started, you know, when I was two, three years old, banging on the piano in the living room. I don't know how my parents took it, <laughs> but they never stopped me. And now the result is that I'm doing all kinds of music for Krishna. Well, Krishna gave me that talent to employ it in his service. Huh? And indeed, this is part of my eternal identity, my eternal relationship with Krishna, is that I do music in the spiritual world for his pleasure. And this is very beautiful. It's a gift from Krishna. Devotional service is always like that. So we find everything in our life that we find so beautiful, that's so wonderful, that we can't give it up. Even if somebody says, you know, you have to give up doing music, I would just like laugh at them. <laughs> no way I'm going to give up doing music. And I was delighted that my spiritual master, Srila Prabhupada, was also a master musician. So this is what we should be doing for Krishna. And then as we become more learned in Krishna's pastimes, we can find a way to engage it in his service. Ultimately, this can lead to uh, realizing our eternal spiritual nature and our eternal service in the spiritual world. Are there any more questions? <clears throat> yes, <clears throat> there is one more. And um, we can just continue with Nevers, and there are two others. So, the proof of an absolute personal conception of God can be seen when Lord Nishrena killed Hiranyakashipu, right? Even though Hiranyakashipu denied the existence of God, God still decided to appear in a personal form to astonish and kill him. So that would prove that there is an absolute conception of God, regardless of how each person thinks about God. Whose question is Neville. it? This is Neville, Neville, right. Yeah, well, Hiranyakashipu wanted to kill God. He said, there is no God. God doesn't exist. No, that's a killing God. That's a way of, you know, getting rid of him. Huh? Of the picture. So uh, God asserted his identity. He said, yes, I do. Bam! <laughs> In your face. <laughs> What's the other question? Um, uh, why are there so many demigods required? Why are there so many demigods required? Well, there's one president in the government. But then there might be thousands of bureaucrats and managers and administrators overseeing departments. Huh? And all these departments are based on the authority of the president or the king. In many cases, the president even appoints directly the individuals in those posts. Uh, delegates his authority, saying, okay, you take care of this department, you take care of that department. Similarly, Krishna, the God doesn't have anything to do. God is never forced to do anything. God, whatever he does, is done out of his sweet will. So when you're managing the material world, there are a lot of things that have to be done in a specific schedule or in a specific way, according to certain rules. So that's not a, a, something that God would do. That's something one of the demigods would do, but they're deputed by, and their authority is delegated by God. Indra, you take charge of uh, managing God's Brahma, you take care of disseminating the Vedas and creating the planetary systems and stuff like that. Shiva, you take care of destruction. Varuna, you take care of the ocean and so on. So all the authority to and the powers to do these different engagements are given Krishna, directly or indirectly. By the way, who's this question? Krishna Prapti. Krishna Prapti. Krishna Prapti this one. Come on. Gods are there to serve God by acting as administrators in the material creation. Because it really is not a um, to do. But in some cases, in some universes, for example, there can't be found a particular living entity that has the qualifications 
to do the job of Brahma or Shiva or something like that. So then the Lord himself becomes that demigod. But this is the exception rather than the rule. Most of the time, God only appears in the material world to perform his pastimes. And these are pastimes. Pastimes means something I do to pass the time. It's not something I have to do. So God's pastimes are executed by will. He appears in this world, reveals his form, goes through so many activities, interacts with all these different individuals, devotees and non-devotees, in appropriate ways, and then he disappears. Uh, why? Because it's his pleasure to do this. It's his pleasure. He says uh, that yada uh, yada hi dharmasya glanir bhavati bharata. I appear in every age to protect the devotees and kill the demons. Uh, that's his purpose. He comes to the material world to teach the absolute truth, the esoteric teaching, and also to uh, stop demons from harassing the devotees, to protect the devotees. That's why he appears, normally he appears in the uh, form of a great king, because then he can make war on non-devotees like Ravana uh, or the Kurus. So uh, in this way, he protects his devotees. He protected his Sita and the monkeys, and he protected the Pandavas, because they're his devotees. That's why God appears. So when he appears, he doesn't have to. Even though the, these appearances are scheduled and known long in advance, especially by Brahma and the other demigods, uh, still, he doesn't have to appear. Um, he appears because he wants to. And uh, the demigods' positions are not... If the demigods screw up, they can be removed. <laughs> uh, just like in Brihad Bhagavatamrita, there's a story that uh, Lord Indra uh, raped some sage's wife and got cursed, <laughs> and he lost his position and fell down. And uh, uh, Gopa Kumar was promoted to the position of Indra, even though he had no desire for it. Uh, he had no desire to become Indra, yet the Lord said, oh, but this, this boy is qualified, he can be. So then he empowered him, gave him all the knowledge, consciousness, and power to be or to function that role, and then he was Indra. But after a while, Gopa Kumar grew tired of this, and he selected somebody else to succeed. And then he went off to uh, the higher uh, planets of the sages and Lord Brahman and like that. So uh, anybody can be. Uh, if we desired, we could advance and become demigods, but we don't really want that. But nobody can replace the Lord. He's unique. Other question? Um, yeah, but if you answer it. What is it? Unlimited personal relationships with Krishna in the sky. Hmm. That's nice. Krishna property. Oh. Mm -hmm. Well, that's not a question. Well, yeah, that's not a question. <laughs> Fact. <laughs> By the way, are these Tulsis in the. Show them these Tulsis, how beautiful they are. I don't think of them, actually. Okay. Ah, that's not. But, uh, yeah, pan over and, and show how, how these Tulsis. These Tulsis, we, uh, these, all these manjaris that you see blooming only came out in the last, what, two days. That was the last time I picked. I, every day I pick about 20 manjaris off of this Tulsi plant. And we've got four or five more just like her. <laughs> They're just going crazy down here because we're giving her the, um, um, the peat that washes up on the bank of the lake. And it's like all these leaves that wash up in winter storms and then they get compacted and they, uh, after a while they compost and they form like really good fertilizer. So we just put a thin layer of it on top of the soil and if we transplant the Tulsis, then we put a bunch of that in, in with the soil in the bigger pot. And as soon as their roots hit it, boom, they just explode. So really such nice, 
rich, uh, abundant Tulsi's in my whole life. We're really blessed. Any other questions before we end up? Okay. Namaste Narasimhaya Namaste Narasimhaya Pralada Lada Dayane Pralada Lada Dayane Hiranya Kashipur Vakshaha Hiranya Kashipur Vakshaha